Okay, welcome to our last week of quantum field theory in this semester. We are currently discussing one loop corrections after uh, the semester on free field quantization, interactions, Feynman rules, and three level Feynman diagrams in QED. And the single one loop diagram that we consider here is the photon vacuum polarization or the photon self energy diagram, which looks like this. We have a photon and a one particle irreducible diagram consisting of a fermion loop. Uh, and we gave it a name minus i sigma mu nu of q, and we analyzed the water identity that uh, uh, we get such a prefactor here and can extract the vacuum polarization. And here are the Feynman rules that we got for this quantity, and today we want to compute uh, this photon vacuum polarization. Um, in so-called dimensional regularization. So as you might know, these one-loop diagrams and loop diagrams in general are afflicted by a problem, namely there are so-called divergences in the calculation which need to be treated, and there is a theory associated to this, uh, namely the theory of regularization and renormalization, and so therefore this is what we need to introduce today, and only after that we can actually calculate and interpret the vacuum polarization. So we will begin now by briefly explaining the basic idea of renormalization theory. And we do not need to do very much. There is, of course, a vast uh, array of theorems and so on associated with it. But in order to end understand the calculation, we can do it actually in a quite simple way. So let us begin. with the basic idea of renormalization. So I already mentioned it. Oh, sorry, I think I need to close this here. The basic idea, uh, as already mentioned, is the following. Namely, our quantum field theory is actually a limit of a class of theories which depend on a so-called regularization parameter epsilon. And so we have a certain set or family of theories for different values of epsilon. And this... Uh, Epsilon is called a regularization parameter. So for each epsilon, there is a theory defined, and uh, the Feynman diagrams, Feynman rules are defined for each epsilon. And then the actual quantum field theory is the limit of that family of theories uh, where epsilon goes to zero. And that limit should be taken in such a way that two criteria are satisfied. Namely, on the one hand, all observables are finite, of course. And that the limiting theory is actually sensible in physics terms. That means it must satisfy certain physical criteria. physical postulates are satisfied. And what are important postulates? That would be, for example, causality, unitarity of time evolution, hold. Okay. So unitarity of time evolution corresponds, for example, to the unitarity of the S matrix, which we have also uh, discussed in the context of gauge theories. And uh, there we have written down a relationship which must hold, and we checked it at lowest order. And there the problem was these negative norm states. But you can uh, apply similar arguments, such that at one loop level also the S matrix should be unitary. And this constrains the limit. and uh, the limiting theories that you want to obtain. Similarly, causality means that operators at space-like distances um, 
should commute, as at least if they correspond to observables, because observables at space-like distances cannot influence each other. And so these are properties which must hold in the final limiting theory, and maybe it's easiest if you implement them for any epsilon, but the main thing is that the final theory that comes out of this limiting procedure has these properties. And so then, for each epsilon, you might get a finite uh, Feynman diagram result and finite such loop integrals. But for epsilon going to zero, certain quantities, certain building blocks, certain expressions might diverge. But observables must come out finite, and these finite observables must be in agreement with those postulates. That is the basic simple idea that we must implement. And so let me sketch uh, how this idea can be realized in practice for the example of QED. So in QED, we start our calculations from the Lagrangian. And all the Feynman rules, Feynman diagrams, they come from the Lagrangian. And therefore, each formula that we write down in QED um, comes from the QED Lagrangian, which in particular contains two parameters, E and M. Therefore, every formula in QED that you write down is somehow a function of E and M. That is the point. And so everything that you calculate will be a function of those two parameters, E and M, which are also called input parameters. And so then, as a sketch, you can calculate everything you want. For example, here, observable sigma 1. Sigma stands for an observable that can also be measured experimentally. A second observable, like for example, here, e plus, e minus, 2 mu plus, mu minus, at low energies, e plus, e minus, 2 mu plus, mu minus, at high energies, or at different angles, theta equals 0, theta equal pi over 2, and so on. So you have many, many things that you can measure. Each quantity for each energy for each angle corresponds to a different observable. There are further observables, of course. Let's say, for example, g minus 2 of the muon, or the hydrogen spectrum. All of those quantities are observables. And you might want to calculate all of the predictions for all of these observables in QED, which means, mathematically speaking, for each of those quantities, you will derive a formula. And each formula will depend on two things, namely E and M. That is always the structure. Now I have to go on here below on the lower blackboard. So what is now the discovery, and uh, that is just a fact of life, is that those relationships here between the fundamental QED Lagrangian and its parameters E and M and the observables that you predict, this relationship is divergent. So if you look at the calculated formula, then that formula will diverge for epsilon going to 0. So it might contain 1 over epsilon. So these relationships here They are divergent, for example, like 1 over epsilon. And now, of course, historically, and uh, maybe even now, you might think this is a disaster because it means that our predictions are meaningless, our predictions are infinite. But there is a very simple solution. You can simply say, actually, we know for sure that those here, those are observables. Therefore, they must be finite. If you accept that any observable must be finite, then the conclusion goes in the other direction. Namely, the conclusion, if you have a finite outcome and a divergent relationship, it simply means the starting point is divergent. And so you can now invert the relationship. For example, you might simply say, I calculate, uh, I use the relationship in order to compute E and M 
from the measured sigma 1 and sigma 2, and then I will get a divergent result for E and M. And that is not a problem as long as we accept that E and M are not observables. Nobody has ever stated or claimed that this E and M is an observable. And so therefore what we simply need to conclude is that this here are divergent quantities. So the Lagrangian is not finite in the limit epsilon going to zero and those parameters E and M, they are also maybe not finite in the limit of uh, epsilon going to zero. So for example, E and M are divergent functions of sigma one and sigma two by simply inverting the corresponding relationship. And in the theory of renormalization, we give a name to such objects, these divergent original fundamental parameters in the Lagrangian, they are called now bare parameters. So they are not observable by themselves, they are just formal input parameters which we use to parameterize our predictions, but they are themselves not observable and they become meaningless in the limit epsilon going to zero. And the hope is now, which is a non-trivial hope, but we can hope that uh, if we do that, if we use, for example, the first two relations, sigma one, sigma two, we take them as finite numbers from experiment, we invert these relationships compute the divergent E and M from it, and then we predict all the other observables as a function of those divergent parameters, but then the divergences cancel. And so we can ultimately predict sigma three, sigma four, and so on, as a function of sigma one and sigma two by just eliminating those divergent quantities, which would then become intermediate building blocks, which are actually not observable. So ultimately we can predict everything as a function of two observables and in those predictions maybe hopefully the divergences just drop out and we get a finite prediction of all the other observables as a function of the first two. That is a hope. So the relations between observables could be finite if E and M are eliminated. Okay. At least it's a logical possibility, right? Even if all those relationships here are divergent, it can be that the relationships between the observables eliminating the left part of the picture could be finite. And that is of course actually the case. But that is a non-trivial statement, it's not obvious. I do not claim it's obvious, but it's a logical possibility which is actually correct. And that is the idea of renormalization theory to implement this program and uh, in the end of course to prove that the hope is true. Um, but first of all, we have to realize that we, it is not a problem for a theory if those formal parameters here, which are not observables, uh, if they are divergent in such a limit epsilon going to zero. The only thing which matters for the uh, predictivity and the uh, sensibleness of the theory is that the relationships between observables, that must of course be finite. And that must be in agreement with such physical postulates as discussed before. So if we have this hope, we uh, can use this uh, kind of practical procedure is that we say, uh, I will write it once again, E and M is now a function of, for example, sigma one and sigma two. So it looks like this. We measure sigma one and sigma two. 
Then we obtain these now so-called bare parameters as a divergent function of those. Once we have it, we predict all the other observables and the result will be finite. Now, that is the principal idea, which is actually also possible to apply really like that in practice. It's not a bad thing to do exactly this. Um, but there is often a technical simplification, which I now also explain. Namely, it is sometimes awkward to express really observables as a function of other observables. Observables are kind of uh, quite complicated objects and uh, it's easier to express all the formulas in terms of not observables but of simpler quantities like E and M, but E and M are unphysical bare parameters and so therefore what is now often possible, let me do it in another color, we can of course introduce new finite parameters. Let's call it E renormalized and M renormalized for example, as fixed functions or with fixed and finite relationship to two observables, for example, two sigma one and sigma two. Okay. So we just replace sigma one and sigma two by two new quantities with a fixed relationship which is by construction finite. And then instead of expressing everything in terms of sigma one and sigma two, we can now express everything as function of E renormalized and M renormalized and it still will remain completely finite. Therefore we can say here or as function of E renormalized and M renormalized. And then it is typically possible to choose those so-called renormalized parameters such that their role is kind of uh, what the name suggests. Their role is something like a charge and a mass. However, this charge and this mass do not have divergent relationships to observables, but by definition, they are finite relationships to observables and therefore those renormalized quantities, they are not the same as those original bare quantities which are in the Lagrangian, but they have also some calculable and probably divergent relationship. But ultimately what we can do and what we want to do is to express all observable quantities as a function of two finite quantities and we can choose either two observables, that is maybe the most uh, the simplest thing to think about or in terms of two new so-called renormalized parameters. That is the general idea and the fact that it works is, as I said, not obvious at all. That is proven by uh, complicated theorems which you can find in particular in the other lectures which are on video also. But uh, it can be applied in practice and today we will do it do that program explicitly for the photon vacuum polarization and you see that at least there it works. And then you can understand what is the principle and the generalization is then done for other opportunities. Okay, so that is our plan and therefore with this in mind, let us uh, try to do it concretely. Do you have any questions to this outline? Yep. We will of course uh, look at concrete examples because the vacuum polarization will provide an example and then for all of what I say here there will be explicit formulas but uh, in principle what it will look like is that for example um, sigma 1 might look like this um, e square um, plus e to the fourth power times 1 over epsilon something like that. This is how such a divergent formula can look like. And then you could on the other hand say uh, by definition 
sigma 1 is equal to E renormalized square. And then you have also a finite relationship by construction between this E re uh, divergent relationship between E renormalized and this original E square, which is now called bare. And uh, then you simply say, I assume that sigma 1 is finite, E renormalized is finite, and I can now calculate that the bare uh, E, bare charge, is divergent because of this relationship. And then my, maybe you calculate the second observable. Uh, what could it be? For example, if you calculate, it is maybe this, E bare square plus E to the 4 bare times 1 over epsilon uh, plus E bare square uh, 4 to the 4 times uh, Q square. Okay. So the second observable is different from the first one, but you see that the second observable differs from the first one by a finite amount only, so can you could express sigma 2 uh, as a function of sigma 1 and the result would be finite, or you could express it as a function of this renormalized uh, charge and then the result would be finite as well. So this is kind of the structure in a nutshell that will emerge. Other questions? Yeah, so we will look at ex exactly those formulas after doing the calculation. And the photon vacuum polarization is basically the quantity which gives rise to such results here. And there will be a certain property of the vacuum polarization which will tell you why it's actually possible that all observables become finite simultaneously. There is a certain structural reason and a certain structural property in the vacuum polarization and in the way these divergencies appear, which uh, allows the simultaneous finiteness of everything. You know, that is, of course, non-trivial. Basically, you have two parameters to absorb the divergencies, but infinitely many observables. So you have infinitely many relationships all of which must become finite by just uh, absorbing divergences in two quantities. And that is a non-trivial thing to do, and it works because of certain properties of the vacuum polarization. So, okay, let's begin. And then we can, let's say, uh, do the same discussion once again after we have seen the results, and then it's maybe worthwhile to really discuss it once more. So, we will not immediately begin with a photon vacuum polarization, but we will do a bit, little bit of general theory of so-called dimensional regularization, which is the regularization method that we will use here for our lecture and for the calculation. And so, uh, let's say for half an hour or so, we will introduce basic concepts and sample calculations in that scheme and then we are ready to apply it to the photon case and to calculate the vacuum polarization. The basic idea of dimensional regularization is simply this, namely, instead of calculating the integrals over loop momenta in four dimensions with this integration measure, we have a d-dimensional space and we assume d to be a continuous variable. So we have here a d-dimensional measure now, and we assume all of our momenta and other similar quantities to be d-dimensional quantities. And in order to make the dimension the same as uh, the actual physical dimension, we introduce here a new prefactor where this mu is an artificial mass scale. And then you have here a mass parameter to the power 4 minus d times the d-dimensional momentum integration, so the dimension overall is 4. 
like in four dimensions. So, and we simply say all four dimensional quantities like momenta, uh, position vectors, also gamma matrices and so on, they are now d-dimensional with obvious relationships. So, and then we want to calculate now immediately a basic integral in d dimensions. This will give us our master formula, which is all we need. Basic one loop integral. And the integration which follows can be done in an integer number of dimensions. It's a mathematically correct uh, calculation that we are going to do but the result will be interpreted in d dimensions where d is a continuous variable which might be real or complex and then of course for real or complex d the result will be a definition and uh, by the calculation it will agree with normal integrals for integer dimensions whenever the integral converges but uh, the result will be defined also um, for complex d and then you can take limits and uh, expand in d minus 4. That is the point. And so this gives rise to the simplest calculations of all the possible regularization methods which exist. So the integral that we are considering is uh, this mu to the 4 minus d times a d-dimensional integral uh, times the following. In the numerator we have a normalization n minus 1 factorial and in the denominator we have k square minus q plus i epsilon to the power n. So we have here n and here n minus 1 factorial, that is a useful normalization. And this i epsilon, epsilon is bigger than zero and small. That is the i epsilon, which uh, is the same as what comes in these propagator Feynman rules, but so far we have ignored the i epsilon in the propagator Feynman rules because at tree level that is not important. However, now in the loop integrations, that plus i epsilon is actually important and we will need it uh, in the next minute. And this q here is assumed to be positive for the moment. And we also will assume that the n here is big enough such that the integrals will converge. And for all the other cases where n is not big enough and where q is negative, the integral will be defined by analytical continuation in the complex plane. So, let us begin by singling out the k0 integral. In other words, the integral over the energy component because the problem is we have here Minkowski metric. Minkowski metric uh, treats the energy differently from the spatial momenta and therefore we do first the integral over energy alone and then uh, we treat the rest in a uniform manner. So the K0 integral. The K0 integral you see here uh, we have a denominator and the denominator can go to zero. It can happen if you do the integral over K0 that uh, somehow there is a cancellation between k0 square and all the rest. And if there is a cancellation, the denominator goes to zero and the plus i epsilon prescription comes into play and we can calculate integrals over such uh, denominators with poles nicely in the complex plane. So we look at the k0 integral as a complex integral and then we need to ask what are the poles of the denominator uh, in this integration variable k0. And the poles are obvious because you have here k0 um, square minus k vector square minus q. So the poles are at k0 square equal to k vector square plus q minus i epsilon. So let's draw the complex plane. Here is the complex k0 plane. Here is the real part of K0. Here is the imaginary part of K0. 
and let's draw into the complex plane the location of the two poles of the integral. Where are the poles? The poles are uh, at q square, uh, k0 square, equal a positive real number minus i epsilon, where epsilon is a very small positive number as well. So the pole, one pole, is at the square root of this, which is a number with a positive real part and a very small negative imaginary part. So one pole is here, below the real axis. And uh, the other pole is at the negative of this, so it's here, just above the real axis at negative real parts. These are the two poles of the integrand um, in the complex K0 plane. Now what is our integration contour? Our integration contour is the real axis. We integrate over K0 from minus infinity to plus infinity, so we integrate over the real axis. So that is our integration contour. So that is our integration contour. Let's call it integration path one. Now what can we do in the complex plane? You know residue theorem, I hope. And uh, the residue theorem tells you that it's easy to evaluate complex integrals over a closed contour in the complex plane because then you only have to look at the poles and their residues. And so let us now look at the following path in the complex plane. We take this and we don't go to infinity but we stop here. Then we take here a part of a circle go here to the imaginary axis, then we go back along the imaginary axis backwards, then we take here again a circle, quarter of a circle, and go towards the real axis. And now we have a closed contour of integration parts in the complex plane. Let's call this here path two, the negative imaginary axis, and then we have two circles here. Let's say path three and path four. Then how have I chosen the complex path? I have chosen the path such that there are no poles inside of the path. The path does not encircle any of the poles. And therefore the residue theorem tells us if we do the integral in the complex K0 plane over this blue path, the integral will, zero, uh, will be zero. And that can be used. So let's write it down, the residue theorem tells us that the integral over k0 um, over path 1 plus integral k0 path 2 plus integral path 3 and 4 of our integrand of course that sum vanishes. But we know also more, namely, so this path here is now, it doesn't go to infinity, but it's kind of at a fixed radius here. But let us make the radius of these circles bigger and bigger. Then of course here we converge towards an integral over the real axis. Here we converge towards an integral over the imaginary axis and the circles get bigger and bigger. What happens to the integral over the circles? The integral over the circles um, has something where in the uh, denominator here there is k0 on the circles where the absolute value of k0 is as big as the radius of the circle that we have chosen. So the integral behaves like one over the radius square to the power n. If n is sufficiently large, then that integral over the circles will go to zero if the radius goes to infinity. So therefore we can neglect this. That goes to zero if the radius goes to infinity. And simultaneously if the radius goes to infinity, that will just be our original integral over the real axis and that will be an integral over the imaginary axis and then we get the relationship that our original integral is minus the integral over 
the negative imaginary axis. And that is a relationship that we can use. So therefore, we obtain the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of dk0 of our integrand is the same as the integral over the negative uh, imaginary axis. So it's from minus i infinity to plus i infinity of dk0 with the same integrand. And now we can uh, go on and do an integral variable substitution. We simply say, okay, we introduce a new variable which we call ke. Uh, for e stands for Euclidean, then we get Euclidean metric. So we say i times ke zero is equal to our original Minkowski k zero. And then we can replace this here by an integral over i times d k e zero with the appropriate integrand. And what are the integration limits? So if k zero goes from my i infinity and uh, e times k e is equal to k zero, then k e zero just goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this new variable k e, the Euclidean energy basically, um, is now a real integration variable and we got a factor of i from the substitution. And the whole thing which we have now proven to be possible is called Wick rotation. And in total it gives rise to the following relationship. So let's introduce a new symbol. So our Original Minkowski k square is of course this k zero square minus k vector square. This is now the same as minus the Euclidean energy square minus k vector square. And so here we now have something completely negative. We can write this as minus a Euclidean vector square. So that is a definition. So uh, Ke square is now a d-dimensional Euclidean vector. And this Ke square is simply the energy Ke zero square plus K vector square. So we have now a d-dimensional Euclidean metric instead of d-dimensional Minkowski metric. And we have shown the following to be true, namely our original integral can be written as follows, i times mu to the power four minus d times now a d-dimensional Euclidean integral over the variable d-dimensional ke divided by two pi to the power d, then n minus one factorial divided by, here we have simply have minus ke square minus q plus i epsilon to the power in. So and here we have now a Euclidean d-dimensional integral and a Euclidean d-dimensional variable ke square. And so now the denominator here is negative definite. So q is positive, ke square is positive definite. Therefore uh, the denominator never goes to zero in the integration region. Uh, it doesn't even approach zero, it doesn't even come close to being zero. Therefore, this epsilon, which is very small, can now be neglected. Doesn't matter anymore. The integral, uh, the integrand here in the bracket is always more negative than minus q. Now, um, negligible. It has done its purpose of telling us where the poles are and uh, because of the location of the poles, this particular contour is the correct one to choose and therefore we get a certain sign here in the prefactor of this substitution rule. That is the outcome of the i epsilon. So then, now we have an integral in d dimensions which depends only on uh, ke square. So this is a spherically symmetric integral. 
over just a spherically symmetric coordinate and therefore we can evaluate it in spherical coordinates, polar coordinates in d dimensions. And then we have actually a completely standard mathematical integrals. So we now have really a standard integrals and we can evaluate them in spherical coordinates. And uh, you have an exercise uh, where I assume that you can check all the integrals which now come. And so actually the result is then simply the following. Our i is i times mu to the power 4 minus d times. So spherical coordinates uh, which are completely symmetric, we get a factor of the d-dimensional um, surface of the d-dimensional unit sphere. So we can integrate over all the angles immediately since the integrand doesn't depend on the angles, omega d divided by 2 pi to the power d from here. And then we only have the radial integral and its prefactors n factorial min n minus 1 factorial and then we can also factor out minus 1 to the power n and then what remains is only the spherical, uh, sorry, the radial integral, let's call it kappa, d kappa uh, over kappa to the power d minus 1 from spherical coordinates divided by the integrand kappa square plus q to the power n. So kappa is the radial coordinate. So and then uh, that is your exercise. You can calculate the surface of the d-dimensional unit sphere. The result is the following. 2 times pi to the power d over 2 divided by the gamma function, gamma, with the argument d over 2. That is your exercise. It's not difficult once you know what the definition of the gamma function actually is. That is basically a very direct calculation. And similarly here, this integral is also a standard mathematical integral, one-dimensional integral, which can be related to the definition of the so-called beta function. The beta function is related to the gamma function, and this integral can then be expressed as follows, one-half q to the power d over 2 minus n times the following combination of gammas, gamma of d over 2 times gamma of n minus d over 2 divided by gamma of n. So and then we have everything. We can write down our final result for our standard integral i. And the result actually simplifies a lot because here from the surface of the unit sphere, we have gamma of d over 2 in the denominator. From the beta function, we have gamma of d over 2 in the numerator, so they cancel. Then gamma of n is nothing but n minus 1 factorial, so the two also cancel, which is the reason why I put this normalization in the beginning. And then what remains is just the 2 pi uh, to the power d, here pi to the power d over 2, so that must be combined somehow. And uh, the 1 half and 2 also cancels, and then what remains is the q to this particular power. So not much remains, so let's write it all down. We have the i, the i came from Wick rotation, minus 1 to the power n, that doesn't go away. Then q to the power d over 2 minus n times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2 times gamma function of n minus d over 2. And this 4 pi comes from combining the pi to that power times the pi with the other power. And this is the nicest way you can write it. So that's actually a very compact result. It contains our physical variable q. q is the only physical quantity in the integral which uh, the result must of course depend on. It contains this q to a certain power in a power-like quantity. And actually you could have guessed this power behavior from the very beginning because 
Uh, actually, the mu is missing. Uh, mu to the power 4 minus d. That, of course, just remains unchanged. Uh, but the q comes just from dimensional analysis. You can uh, look at the uh, unit of the result. And the only dimensionful quantity is q. Therefore, q must appear to that power in order to match the unit of the left-hand side of the equation. Now we can uh, use um, the, let's say, idea of dimensional regularization, where we set the dimension to 4 minus 2 epsilon, and epsilon is then our regularization parameter. And from now on, we allow that the dimension is actually uh, an arbitrary real or complex number. And this epsilon might also be an arbitrary real or complex number in particular. It can continuously go to 0. And the integral is now here defined for arbitrary values of d. It's an analytic function. It's a holomorphic function of d. So it's well defined in, in the complex plane. Initially, it's only defined in a certain region for positive q and for a sufficiently large n. But now everything here is analytic, holomorphic. So you can use analytic continuation to define it for all q and so on. And uh, by the way, I use a different notation for this epsilon and the other epsilon. If you want, you can copy my notation. So this is in LaTeX, the var epsilon. And uh, that here is in LaTeX, the epsilon. So just to let you know that I always distinguish uh, that epsilon, which is small, positive, and has to do with the propagators and complex poles. That here is our regularization parameter. And the two have absolutely nothing to do with each other. So if we plug that in, then we can write down our integral once more. And we can first summarize all the factors which we get if we plug in d exactly equal to 4, ignoring the epsilon for a moment. So what happens if we set d equal to 4? Then we get the following factors. We get Two, uh, 4 pi to the power minus 2. And we get the i, so we can have the prefactor i over 16 pi square. Then uh, that mu doesn't appear for d equal 4. And here we get q to the power of 2 minus n. And of course, we also have the minus 1 to the power n. Then. Uh, we get the correction for uh, the d equal minus 2 epsilon. So here from the mu, we get mu to the power plus 2 epsilon. From here, we get an additional q to the power minus epsilon. So overall, we get the ratio mu squared divided by q to the power epsilon. And then we get the gamma function. And from the 4 pi, we also get 4 pi to the power epsilon and the gamma function of n minus, uh, what is it, 2 plus epsilon. Okay. That is our final result, separated according to things in four dimensions and uh, quantities which explicitly depend on epsilon. So for epsilon going to 0, that might go to some value, maybe to 1 over epsilon. Anyway, let me stress again that uh, this behavior here and also that behavior here that could be pr predicted. So that is, let's say, clear from dimensional analysis. This here is coming out of the calculation, so that cannot be predicted from dimensional analysis, but it's a result of the calculation. And it's interesting, because uh, from the loop calculation, we apparently get some small prefactor. 1 over 16 pi square is a number which is uh, less than uh, 1%. So therefore, typically, the results from one loop calculations are suppressed by this factor, which is less than 1%. And so the one loop corrections are typically small. This is a typical one loop prefactor, which will appear in all one loop calculations. <laughs>
and then here uh, that is also the result from the calculation. So this non-trivial part of the result which must come from the explicit calculation that is this gamma function so the result depends on our regularization parameter epsilon mainly in terms of this gamma function here which is a known mathematical function and therefore it's very easy to analyze and to plug in results into explicit computations. So that ends our discussion of the so-called master formula. This is the master formula. We started with a uh, very simple, however, also quite general one loop type diagram, namely a d-dimensional K integration over something which looks like a propagator with some uh, arbitrary quantity here, but otherwise it looks like a propagator with a momentum K square to some power. And as we will see in a moment, all one loop integrals, okay, we will see it for one example, but uh, I can tell you that all one loop integrals in quantum field theory can be reduced to this expression. Therefore, this expression is actually enough to evaluate all one loop integrals that can appear in any quantum field theory like QED. How that works, I will show you. Okay? But therefore, the master formula is very important and it gives rise to this one line result which is a function of epsilon, where epsilon can be defined in the um, complex plane. By the way, it's not important that the dimensional regularization epsilon can be complex, but what is important is that all these functions here are analytic functions, therefore we know a lot about their behavior, uh, like Taylor expansions, uh, continuity, differentiability, and so on. And we also know that they can be analytically continued from some region where integrals converge to other regions. next step. We slowly move closer towards our vacuum um, polarization. Yep. And we compute one specific loop function which has a name in the literature. It is called B0 of 0, comma m, comma m. This loop function is defined as follows. Uh, namely, we define this one loop prefactor i over 16 pi square times b0 of 0, comma m, comma m. That, uh, and so the b0 will then be the interesting part without this typical one loop prefactor. Okay, that is why the definition is like that. And it corresponds basically to this Feynman diagram where we have here no incoming momentum, so the incoming momentum Q is zero. Therefore, in both propagators, we simply have loop momentum K, and we assume that both propagators have the same mass M. And therefore, you can understand what the arguments mean. In principle, there would be a Q argument here if you have an incoming momentum Q, and if you have different masses, then you could have m1, m2 as arguments. And we only compute a special case where we have no incoming momentum and where both masses are equal to the same m. That is all we need, actually. But you can understand that there would be a more general definition. And so this particular case has then the following integral, namely mu to the 4 minus d times this d-dimensional k integral times 1 divided by k square minus m square to the power 2. So both propagators have the same mass m and the same momentum k, and uh, therefore that is our integral. So and this integral here is defined to be b0 with that argument times the one loop prefactor. <coughs> 
So, and you see that this integral corresponds to our master formula, right? It directly corresponds to our master formula. Namely, we have here n equal 2. We have the propagator to the power 2. And the general quantity q is now simply m square. Okay. So, and therefore, we can immediately read off what the result is. What is the result for our b0 of 0, comma m, comma m? It's what we have here apart from the factor i over 16 pi square. So what is it, that result? So minus 1 to the power 2 is now plus 1. Q to the power 2 minus n, n is 2. That is also absent, it's just 1. Therefore, we only get the epsilon part. We get mu square divided by m square to the power epsilon times 4 pi to the power epsilon times the following gamma function, n is 2 gamma of epsilon. That's all. Very simple result. So we have calculated our first one-loop Feynman diagram, namely this one. This is the result in dimensional regularization. Now let us discuss the result a little bit. And in order to discuss it, we need to know something about the gamma function. That was your exercise to prepare uh, some background knowledge on the gamma function. So let me just repeat the main points. The gamma function has the property of this recursion formula. z times gamma of z is equal to gamma of z plus 1 for any uh, argument c in the complex plane. So the gamma function is a function defined in the complex plane. And therefore, it's a generalization of the factorial function. And so in particular, let's also write it down. Gamma of n is equal to n minus 1 factorial for uh, natural numbers n. Now. The gamma function is defined in the complex plane, so it is uh, an analytic function in the complex plane. And what is particularly interesting is to look at its um, expansion around the point 1. So gamma of 1 is 1. And uh, therefore, the expansion around 1 starts with 1 plus epsilon times the derivative of gamma at the point 1 plus higher orders in epsilon. Uh, epsilon square. And so um, that derivative of the gamma function at uh, 1 is, of course, a fascinating, very important mathematical irrational number, which has a name. And uh, this is the so-called euler mascheroni constant. And so we have here minus epsilon times gamma e plus order epsilon square. So the derivative of the gamma function at 1 is actually negative. And it's, uh, it's called minus this euler mascheroni constant gamma e. So gamma e is called the euler mascheroni constant. And it has a numerical value of around 0 0.57 and so on. So it's, of course, a transcendental irrational number. So putting this together, we can obtain an expansion of gamma of epsilon. What is gamma of epsilon? Gamma of epsilon can now be obtained by taking the recursion formula and the expansion around 1. Namely, gamma of epsilon is the same of gamma as gamma 1 plus epsilon divided by epsilon, because that is just the recursion formula solved for gamma of epsilon. But now we can plug in our expansion of gamma of 1 plus epsilon 
which starts at 1. So we now get 1 over epsilon, that is the divergence. And we get minus the euler mascheroni constant plus higher orders in epsilon. And so here you now see how dimensional regularization regularizes divergences if we approach dimension d going to 4, epsilon goes to 0 and we get a pole that corresponds to the divergence of our original loop integrals. But if we keep d unequal to 4 or epsilon unequal to 0, we get here a finite result. And so we have very nicely and uh, in a mathematically very transparent way isolated our divergences and that makes the renormalization procedure where the divergences should cancel in the end very, very transparent and easy to work with. So what we then need is some combination like this, some quantity x to the power epsilon times this gamma of e because that's exactly the form of our result here. So how can you work with this? x to the power epsilon is the same as e to the power epsilon times ln x. That's the same times gamma of epsilon. And so that is now expanded 1 plus epsilon times ln x plus higher orders in epsilon. And this is 1 over epsilon minus gamma e plus higher orders in epsilon. And so therefore, if we multiply, we get one term 1 over epsilon still. Then we get minus gamma e. And here we get 1 over epsilon times epsilon plus ln x plus higher orders in epsilon. So, and therefore we can now expand our B0 result and interpret it. B0 of 0, comma m, comma m is equal to the following. So this whole expression has now that form, 1 over epsilon minus euler mascheroni constant, then plus ln x, and ln x is the logarithm of that combination here, which can be split into the logarithm of that plus the logarithm of this. So let's first write plus ln 4 pi plus ln mu square over q. That is our result for the B0 function when we ignore higher order terms in epsilon. And now you see here something. We can interpret the result, namely uh, physical quantities are all contained in, uh, actually yq, it's of course m square. And in general it might be q. But uh, the physical variable here is only the m. That is the only physical quantity the result depends on, and that is localized here in that logarithm, which contains the ratio of this artificial uh, mass scale mu and the physical mass scale m. That is the physical result from our loop integration. And that will enter observable quantities in the end. But this combination here is all a regularization artifact. So first of all, the divergence, 1 over epsilon, which is the purpose of the regularization. But also those quantities here, they are kind of artificially introduced from the way we defined this dimensional regularization. Could have been done differently, but they basically come from products of the 1 over epsilon from the gamma function with this d-dimensional um, spherical coordinates and so on. So this is just as unphysical as the 1 over epsilon. And therefore we can combine all of those three quantities into one and that is very often done in practical calculation. So all of this is often called capital delta, which is a typical divergent combination. So it's a, not everything is divergent, but it's a divergent combination. And if we would say B0 and then take only the, the divergent part, then by this we would mean this entire combination because those finite parts can be attributed to the divergence. And that here is the physical finite result. 
And for example, on your exercise sheet, you are once asked to isolate the divergent part or the finite part, and then I'm referring to this kind of split. So that all would be counted as divergent. That would be counted as finite. Any questions to this B0 function? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are thinking of QED, and uh, this is just a generic Feynman diagram we, uh, which does not correspond to QED, but where the propagators have simply a one in the numerator and where the vertices also are defined to be one. So in that sense, it's a more abstract Feynman diagram, but it illustrates the integral. And of course, in QED, we have a complicated numerator and so on. And we have vertex vectors, and therefore, in QED, uh, which is now the next topic, we need to uh, work a little bit until we find that our vacuum polarization can be reduced to this integral. Good. Okay, so let us maybe only leave the B0 function, which is, of course, what we need. And then we can now compute the vacuum polarization. Okay. Now I have to concentrate a little bit because of course the photon vacuum polarization is quite simple to calculate, but uh, only if you have experience. I have now tried a bit to optimize the sequence of steps exactly in this way that we absolutely minimize what we need to do. And so I need to follow extremely closely uh, this outline here. So pi gamma in dimensional regularization. So that was what we had in the beginning. So minus i times uh, sigma mu mu of q contracted over the two Lorentz indices, um, which was the same, uh, okay, so let's, uh, which was uh, basically given by this Feynman diagram, is this minus e q square times the integral over k of the following trace, gamma mu k slash plus m, gamma mu downstairs, Q slash plus K slash plus M. And in the denominator, we have K square minus M square and Q plus K square minus M square. That is our integral. And so the numerator is not one and the denominator does not have the form of our previous master formula, where we just have one denominator squared, but we have now a product of two different denominators. So therefore, we have two tasks to solve. We have to get rid of the numerator, and we have to bring the denominator into the form of our master formula. And in order to do that, we will apply two tricks uh, in the perfect order, I hope. Um, but both tricks that I am going to show you are extremely general tricks. So they are not only applicable here, but those two methods are really the key methods in order to evaluate all loop integrals, actually not even only one loop, but also integrals of higher order. But we will apply it in a very specific way to this integral. So first of all, in the numerator, we have now the following combination again. K uh, slash sandwiched between gamma mu, gamma mu. And we had this combination already before, but now we need to evaluate it once again in d dimensions instead of in four dimensions. So in d dimensions, uh, you can still do the anti-commutator trick from before. So we write this as minus the opposite order plus the anti-commutator. And from the opposite order, we get then gamma mu, gamma mu contracted, which gives now d instead of 4. And from the other term, we get a factor 2. So we get 2 minus d times k slash. And previously, we had 2 minus 4 was minus 2 times k slash. And now we have 
2 minus d times k slash. And everything else is kind of obvious. And then we evaluate our numerator. So we have a simple trace with up to uh, two gamma matrices only, because uh, the gamma mu's are now gone. So we have a trace, um, which is minus eq square times the trace of the following. We have two minus d times uh, k slash, and then times the other k slash plus q slash. And then we have the mass terms plus d times m square. The m squared term has some just gamma mu, gamma mu contracted, gives the dimension d. So, and uh, this trace is trivial, so you get uh, minus e q squared times 4 times the following, namely 2 minus d times the scalar product, k squared plus k dot q, because the trace of two gamma matrices just gives the metric tensor, and plus d times m square. Then we have our numerator, and our numerator is now a set of scalar products. It doesn't contain gamma matrices anymore, but only momenta or constants. So it's still a complicated numerator, which depends on our integration variable, k. So uh, therefore, uh, we cannot apply our master formula, which had a 1 in the numerator. But that is um, the result for our numerator at first. Now comes the first of these very famous and very general tricks that we need to apply. And the first trick is the following. So-called Feynman parameters. Namely, we write 1 over a product a times b as an integral 0 to 1 dx of a times 1 minus x plus b times x squared. Okay. That is Feynman's trick. Actually, also Schwinger apparently invented this, but it's called Feynman parameters. So if you integrate, uh, this is a trivial rational function to integrate over x then uh, plugging in the two limits gives you 1 over a minus 1 over b, and uh, bringing it to a common denominator gives you 1 over a times b, and the numerator just cancels from the integral. So that is trivial to show by just evaluating the integral. And so that can now be applied to simplify our denominator. Let's do that here. Our denominator of the Feynman diagram was a product of two different denominators. And with Feynman parameters, we can make it into one denominator squared, which is similar to our master formula. So let's apply this idea to our denominator. And then we get an integral 0 to 1 dx of the following something square. And in the bracket, we now have the sum of the two denominators times 1 minus x or times x. That gives k square minus m square times 1 minus x plus q plus k square minus m square times x. Okay, let's simplify. Let's simplify. How many k square do we have in the denominator? How many k square? Yep. Yeah, right. And if we add the prefactors, 1 minus x plus x one. gives 1. Right, so we have exactly k square without any x dependence. That is generally true in Feynman parameters, which is one of the reasons why this is so powerful. It's really a simplification. So we just have k square. What else do we have? How many m square do we have? One m square. Right, m square times 1 minus x minus x, so minus m square. What else do we have? We have k dot q, 
2 times k dot q times x plus 2x k dot q. And we have q square times x. So, okay, that's what we have. That is uh, yeah, now similar, uh, more similar to our master formula, but it's not yet quite the master formula because we don't only have k square, but we also have q dot k. And we can re get rid of that by doing a variable substitution, basically complete the square, complete the square and then do an appropriate variable substitution. And so let's do the following variable substitution. k goes to k minus x times q. That is our variable substitution. And then our denominator in terms of the new k, k is now changed. In terms of the new k, our denominator is equal to the integral 0 to 1 dx. And then what do we have? We have k square plus 2xk dot q, if we plug in this replacement, the linear term q, q dot k, it just cancels, it drops out between the two terms. Therefore, we have just the new k square. But then we also get um, the q square times x remains, but from here we then get an additional term uh, which is not there, so we have to subtract minus x square times q square, and then the rest remains plus q square times x minus m square. And then we have our master formula denominator, namely k square plus something else. And that we can integrate using our master formula. And we can call all of this stuff here minus capital Q. And then we have our master formula. The point is that this capital Q does not depend on the integration momentum. It depends on x. So we still have a one-dimensional integral to do, which we maybe didn't foresee, but that will be simple to integrate. But anyway, now we have the structure of our master formula in the denominator, and so here we have a definition of our Q. Good. What happens to our numerator if we do the same variable substitution? Of course, the numerator uh, must undergo the same variable substitution now. Taking it from before, it becomes minus eq square times 4 times the bracket. And what is going on in the bracket? 2 minus d times, okay, now we have to calculate a little bit, k square plus q dot k. If we replace k by this combination, we get the following, k square plus x square q square minus x times q square plus terms proportional to q dot k plus d times m square. Okay. So here I uh, give you the result and uh, I omit terms of the form q dot k. Uh, let's not bother to write down what they are, but the k square terms and uh, the k, uh, the q square terms, they are explicit. So, why do I not bother to write down the k dot q terms? Because they drop out. They would appear as follows, integral over k with a numerator k dot q divided by k square minus q square in the denominator. So we have even odd integrand so the numerator is odd in the integration variable, the denominator is even, and we integrate over all of space-time, therefore the integral vanishes. Therefore we can uh, only consider the even terms k square and uh, the q square terms. So now we have to combine everything. Our full integral is the uh, now the integral over this numerator divided by that denominator. And that is still not simple because our master formula contains a constant in the numerator and here we however have k square. That is not a constant, so we need another simplification. 
And that simplification is again possible by doing a second extremely general and very important trick, which can be applied here in a specific way, namely the so-called integration by parts. That is actually extremely powerful also for multi-loop calculations. And here it works as follows. We write down zero on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side we have an integral over k in d dimensions over a total k derivative, d k mu. So this always vanishes in dimensional regularization, and we can now write the following k mu divided by k square minus q to the power one. Okay. What happens if we evaluate this? So that must be zero, that corresponds to integration by parts, or surface integrals are zero. So if we evaluate the derivative, we get two terms. Once, let's apply the derivative onto the numerator, k mu derivative with respect to k mu. For each component, we get a one and we contract over all the components, so we get, uh, we get d, the number d of dimensionality of space-time in the numerator, divided by that denominator. Then from the other term, we, get, uh, we apply the derivative onto the denominator, so we get minus the denominator squared, and in the numerator, first of all, we get the k mu, but then we get the inner derivative 2k mu as well. Now you see here k squared divided by something squared, which is exactly the term that was disturbing us. So we get a relationship which relates our term, which we don't like, to something which has a constant in the numerator. But actually we can simplify it here a little bit more. Um, adapt it to our case, and as I said, I need to follow here very closely my notes. So let's bring it all to one structure with this denominator square, and then we can expand here d times k square minus q. So that is the same thing, minus 2k square. And uh, then we have here another k square in the numerator, and we can uh, write it as follows. We get the following consequence. Namely, on the left-hand side we have 0, and on the right-hand side we have d minus 2k square is equal to something. So let's write this as the following. Integral 2 minus d times k square divided by the denominator square is equal to the rest, is equal to minus d times q divided by the denominator square. And so that is well adapted to our problem, because in our problem, the k square actually appears with a prefactor 2 minus d. And now we can directly relate 2 minus d times k square to something else. And now we can write it down. So the numerate integral, numerator divided by denominator, is now equal to the following, minus e times q squared times 4 times um, the integral. And what is now our integral? We have the denominator, k squared minus q squared. And in the numerator, let's collect um, 2 minus d times k squared has become minus d times q minus d times q. Then we get plus 2 minus d times this q square term, 2 minus d times uh, x square minus x times q square. Um, plus d times m square. That's all. It fits in. Right. And so now magically it simplifies even more. So you see uh, the k square has gone. It was replaced by that. 
minus d times q from here. And uh, the complicated q square messy term here, we uh, see here, the, um, and the d times m square appears there. So what was actually minus q? Minus q is, contains minus m square. So inside of this minus d times q, there is minus d times m square plus d times m square drops out. The m square completely drops out. Then what remains here in the minus q, what remains is just that, minus x square q square plus x q square. That is the same structure as here. It's the same structure as here, but with a prefactor minus, uh, minus and minus 2 minus, uh, sorry, minus d. So therefore we get this term times 2 minus d minus another d gives that term times 2 minus 2d. That's all. So we get the following, minus e times q square times 4, now times uh, 2 minus 2d times integral over x square q square minus x times q square divided by the propagator square. And now we have it, here we have our master formula because now from the um, loop integration point of view, the numerator does not depend on k anymore, so it is a constant. The denominator has the master formula form, k squared minus q squared. So the result here is actually our B0 function with the argument q and uh, some prefactor. And so let's write it down. Minus e times q square times 4 times 2 times 1 minus d. Let's write it like this. Then times x square minus x times q square times i divided by 16 pi square times b0 of 0 comma q, comma q. And so time is almost up, but let me just write down the final result for the vacuum polarization because now we have completely evaluated it. So the left hand side of what I wrote here was uh, the vacuum polarization times a prefactor. The prefactor came from the contraction of the two indices mu mu. And the prefactor also contained exactly this. The prefactor contained 1 minus d and q square. So we can directly read off from this not only the self energy sigma, but the vacuum polarization pi gamma. Yes? Just throwing in the integration over x, which. Yeah. Okay, that was always kind of included, uh, right? So let's put it here, integration over x. Yes. So then we can read off the full pi gamma by dividing by all the prefactors that we had collected before. And then the pi gamma is actually e times q square divided by 16 pi square. That comes from the one loop prefactor then times um, 8 times the integral 0 to 1 dx of x minus x square times b0 of 0 comma q comma q where q is given by m square minus q square times x times 1 minus x and for tomorrow let us abbreviate the whole thing, uh, yet another name, a gamma of q square, where a gamma of q square is simply the same apart from the coupling constant which we want to um, exhibit in order to do bare versus renormalized E and so on. And then it's nice to have here a combination a gamma which depends only on integrals and not on coupling constants. So this is our result. 
And the B0 function was given explicitly. It contains a logarithm of Q. And so what we end up with here is a one-dimensional integral over X over a logarithm of X's and Q squared and M. So it's a not completely trivial one-dimensional integral, but of course completely well-defined and uh, could be evaluated numerically or analytically um, as you wish. That is our vacuum polarization and we have computed it quite quickly by applying Feynman parameter and uh, integration by parts and uh, in such a way that we could immediately divide by all the prefactors and get this nice integral representation. And tomorrow we will do physics with it, interpret it, see the finiteness of, of observables and uh, then discuss physics implications of this result here. Okay, so see you tomorrow. <laughs>